If I could uh, have everyone's attention at this time and ask everybody to take their seats, if we might, I'm Congressman Ed Royce. I chair the Foreign Affairs Committee. And we have with us here Mr. Stuart Force, Mike, Mike McCall, many of you know, is chairman of the uh, Homeland Security Committee. Congressman Brad Sherman from Los Angeles. Congressman Hank Johnson is with hey. us as well. What I, what I thought I might do here is um, let me say a few words of introduction, if I could, on behalf of Mr. Stuart Force, uh, because I, I wanted to share with him how much we admire his work, the work he's done, the work his wife Robbie has done to try to ensure that no other family has to endure the pain that their family has endured. Their son, Taylor Force, was a great American patriot. He uh, was a West Point graduate, as you know, who served his country with honor in Iraq and had served in Afghanistan. And I, I remember our meeting last uh, spring with Senator Corker. My Democrat counterpart, Elliot Engel, and I have put together a bipartisan House version of the Taylor Force Act which we will be marking up in a few weeks. And I want to thank him again for taking the time to address us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Stuart Force. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chairman Royce, and to the Hudson Institute. As you'll uh, notice very quickly, I'm not an expert in any of the subject matter today. I'm here as, a, as an unofficial, unofficial representative of a uh, group that no one ever wants to be a part of. Families of victims of terror. We lost terror, uh, Taylor in a uh, Palestinian terror attack in Israel about a year and a half ago and we immediately became members of that horrific club. He was a West Point grad, and as Chairman Roy said, two combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan and brought his troops home safely from both tours. Completed his Army commitment, went back to school, and he was a grad student at Vanderbilt University on a spring trip to Israel when the attack occurred. The purpose of this conference, I believe, is to uh, get a better understanding of the big picture, uh, how terrorism and all its forms and facets comes together. Uh, in my experience, I've always been concerned with a small corner of the big picture, just taking care of smaller items and not worrying about understanding how everything works. Over the past year and a half, we've had to try to understand the world at large and exactly how this terrorism puzzle is put together. Big picture is pretty hard to comprehend, but with your work and your expertise, I think we can uh, make some inroads in the funding of terror. The goal of everybody working on the big picture and the little picture, which is the Taylor Force Act, I think needs to come together and provide effective work to get both of these things accomplished. The Taylor Force Act, if you're not aware, is legislation that holds, uh, holds back foreign aid, the United States foreign aid, to the Palestinian Authority until they can certify to the Secretary of State that our foreign aid is not being diverted to reward terrorist activities in Israel by the Palestinians. There are, there are rewards to the terrorists, or if they die, to the martyrs' families, of up to $2,300 per month, which is quite a bit more than the average Palestinian earns. <clears throat> the severity of the crime, the severity of the act, determines how much the reward is. The fact that our tax dollars are being diverted to support terrorism is unacceptable. 
Taylor Force Act would stop off the funds, and that's what my wife and I have been involved in supporting for the last year and a half. I think the goal of both those working on the big picture and those working on the small parts of the big picture should be to disband the club of the families of terrorist victims through lack of membership. I thank you for listening to my short remarks, and I appreciate you being here and your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Forrest. Um, uh, for many of us, I, I don't know if we remember, if we remember this, but today is also the 34th anniversary of the Marine barracks bombing where Hezbollah murdered 241 U.S. service members. And given this solemn occasion, uh, I, I think we need to thank uh, all of you for providing the opportunity to share thoughts on the topics before us today. Those topics are Iran and Qatar, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the general regional instability, and what we can do to shape policy, and that's the important work here of the Hudson uh, Institute, shaping policy, helping us shape that policy uh, in order to counter the challenges that we have before us. So I'd like to turn to my good friend, Chairman Mike McCall. He's chairman of the Homeland Security Committee. He has to leave soon uh, because he has five bills on the floor of the House. I, the last time I checked, we we're going into session at 2 o'clock, and the first bills up were Homeland Security. So I suspect he probably needs to speak and then get down there to the floor to make sure he presents them. But uh, Mr. Chairman, Mike McCall. Thanks, Ed. Well, let me, uh, thank you, Ed, and I want to thank uh, Stuart for being here. I was proud to co-sponsor legislation bearing his son's name. As many of you know, he was killed uh, in Israel by Palestinian uh, terrorists, and uh, our thoughts and prayers are with thank you, sir. Um, I also want to thank the Hudson, Hudson Institute. They actually helped uh, me write my book, uh, Failures of Imagination, and put together some creative uh, energy uh, in the room. But I want to take sort of you back historically, I think what, what has passed is prologue. That's what's at the archives. And I think it's important to look back at the year 1979. That year transformed the Middle East and changed uh, the world. And that year, radical Islamist ideology rippled around the globe. And the revolution in Iran brought the Ayatollah and his oppressive Shia theocracy uh, to power. That same year, a dark veil of Sunni extremism fell over Saudi Arabia and other Arab nations. And also that year, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. And the Mujahideen, under the leadership of Osama bin Laden, became a force to be reckoned with. It was as, as if time had gone backwards. And today, 38 years later, and 16 years after 9-11, the threat landscape remains. The Ayatollah is more powerful than ever. The Sunni extremists continue their reign of terror, and the Russians have returned to the region to control the ports in Syria and prop up the dictator Bashar al-Assad. Fortunately, last week we saw a crushing blow to ISIS in Raqqa, Syria, and in, before that in Mosul. And after watching, as Ed and I watched this so-called caliphate metastasize in Iraq and Syria under the previous administration and over the life of my chairmanship, and after constant briefings on their external operations and threats to the homeland, we can finally see a defeat of ISIS in the region. But before we celebrate or claim victory, I believe it's important to caution that radical Islamist terror is still alive and well. And all one needs to do is look at the northern Africa and the recent events in Niger. All one needs to do is look at Iran and its growing presence in the Middle East. All one needs to do is look at how hateful ideology mastered the global bandwidth of the internet by recruiting, training, and radicalizing future militants to its cause. I recently traveled to Israel with Chairman Royce, and there we had a candid discussion with Prime Minister Netanyahu about the greatest threat to his country, the Shia crescent from Iran. Iran is filling the vacuum in Iraq and Syria, and through Hezbollah, it's building rocket manufacturing 
plants in Lebanon through Hamas. It's digging, digging tunnels and aiming rockets against the Iron Dome. And in Yemen, it's backing the Houthi rebels. The prime minister also briefed us on the relationship and opportunity that has arisen between Israel and Saudi Arabia, once proclaimed enemies. Now these two nations have a unique alliance. The enemy of my enemy is Iran. This threat exists not only against what Iran references to as little Satan, but also what it calls the great Satan, the United States. The threat of a nuclear Iran is real and must be stopped. And in Congress, under Ed Royce's leadership, we passed the sanctions on Iran's ballistic missile program, as well as Hezbollah. And as the president announced, we will also sanction the Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, a bill that I passed in two prior Congresses to designate them as a foreign terrorist organization, because that is what they are. Finally, we must deal with the issue of terror financing. Qatar stands as a leader when it comes to funding Hamas, ISIS extremists in Syria. They fund Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Qatar also has a unique and disturbing relationship with Iran. I believe it's time to hold them accountable. If Qatar is to remain an ally, it must renounce its terror affiliations. Thank you. <laughs> Muslim Brotherhood continues on the march to threaten Egypt and the region. It was also Al-Qaeda that grew out of the Brotherhood. President Morsi and the so-called Arab Spring liberated them. President al-Sisi is trying to restrain them, and we must support him. The Muslim Brotherhood under Yusuf al-Qaradawi proclaimed that Allah used Adolf Hitler to wreak the Holocaust upon the Jews as divine punishment and praised him for putting the Jews in their place. Winning this struggle is personal to me. My father was a bombardier in World War II and participated in the D-Day air campaign. He bombed the Nazis. I recently visited Auschwitz to see firsthand the terror and systematic exterminations that the Nazis perpetrated on the Jewish people and the horrors of the gas chambers and Dr. Mengele. What my father and Ed Royce's father and their generation were fighting against was pure evil. It is no surprise that the radical Islamists were then allies of the Nazis. As a once famous Jewish man said, in Jewish history, there are no consequences. We must always remember and never forget. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman McCall. Uh, also, Congressman Brad Sherman, who's with us, who's done important work on uh, the terrorism uh, subcommittee of foreign affairs. This has been part of his focus. Uh, he's with us here today and uh, a good friend and colleague. I'd like to welcome Congressman Brad Sherman. Hello, I'm Brad Sherman from California's best name city, Sherman Oaks. <clears throat> For 21 years, I've sat with uh, Chairman Royce on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And he was there back in 1997 when I put forward the proposition that Iran was the number one threat to American national security. As to Qatar, Amir Al Thani is trying to perform an effort of political gymnastics that would have disabled Nadia Kolmanich. <laughs> Look at the splits. He seeks to have one foot with the Brotherhood and the extremist Sunni. He seeks to put another foot with the United States, the moderate Sunni, and the Gulf Cooperation Council. And while these legs are separated beyond human capacity, he's trying to do it all while kissing Ayatollah Khamenei. That is a disabling act of uh, gym, political gymnastics. He may believe that we are obligated to protect his regime because he hosts an American political base. The Castro brothers never reached the same conclusion. Uh, it is time for Al Thani to pick a side, stop supporting Al Nusra, and stop supporting Hamas. As to Iran, we need the maximum sanctions, the maximum enforcement of nuclear restrictions, and the maximum international support. 
One way to justify additional sanctions is to renounce the nuclear deal. Doing that would cause Europe not to support our additional sanctions, and, in many, and many, of, uh, 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 many in the world would even say that Iran was then free to reopen uh, its nuclear program without inspections or restrictions. Fortunately, the world is based, is blessed, with an almost uh, 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 beyond possible use um, natural resource, and that is our supply of evil coming from Tehran. We can impose the maximum sanctions without even mentioning the Iran deal, and then we will have European support as we point to almost 500,000 dead Syrian civilians, a direct responsibility of Tehran. As we point to the terrorism around the world, as we point to how they treat their own people and the execution of those in the LGBT community. There is no shortage of reason to support, to uh, impose sanctions on Iran. And if we do enough, they will come begging to us to, know, to have negotiations on all the pending issues, including the inadequacies of the nuclear deal. Thank you. Another member of Congress who's been very active on these issues is Congressman Hank Johnson, and uh, a good friend, and I'd like to welcome him at this time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon to the visitors here today. Thank you for having us. I want to uh, extend my apologies, or not my apologies, but my condolences to you, Mr. Force, on the loss of your dear son. And um, I would say that uh, before we can reach uh, peace in the Middle East, we're going to have to resolve the dispute involving the Palestinian state, a, a homeland, before we can have peace in the Middle East, it's my opinion that we're going to need to solve the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, and it will have to result in a two-state solution, one state for the Palestinians and another for Israel. And I think once that's done, it's gonna go a long way towards diffusing a lot of the uh, uh, radicalism that uh, is in existence in the uh, Middle East. That issue, of course, is not the only issue, and it, it's, it's not the greatest issue or the greatest threat to America. Uh, but before I begin my talk, let me say how much I appreciate the Hudson Institute, an organization committed to dialogue and understanding. Uh, I commend the Hudson Institute for its dedication to American leadership and global engagement for a secure, free, and prosperous future through the disciplines of defense, economics, healthcare, technology, culture, and international relations, as well as the rule of law. And um, I think before we can begin to talk about peace in the uh, Middle East or the suppression of violent uh, extremism that is really uh, threatening to the whole world, we've got to look at the issue of Islam. And Islam is, uh, is not a religion of uh, hatred and violence, uh, but it has been used by forces that, uh, that cloak themselves in Islam and then proclaim to represent Islam, uh, distorting its uh, teachings. I think we must respect uh, Islam, the world's second largest religion, uh, one of the three Abrahamic uh, religions. I think we must uh, uh, respect that religion and we must respect those who want to be peaceful adherents to that religion. But we do have a group, uh, and they are based, they are Saudi Arabia based. It's the Wahhabist sect of Islam, uh, which is the state religion of Saudi Arabia, which is the greatest exporter of 
ideas of violent extremism uh, on the face of the earth, in my humble opinion. Wahhabism <laughs> is, um, an, and until we can address the issue of Saudi Arabia's support for Wahhabism and, the, and its spread of violent jihadist, uh, a violent jihadist philosophy, then we will continue to uh, kind of uh, mire ourselves further into the, the, uh, the mud. And I hope that we can wean ourselves from our dependence on oil, which seems to be the driving force of our policy towards Saudi Arabia so that we can deal with this issue of Wahhabism uh, to a greater degree than we do now. Thank you. Thank you. If I could sort of sum up here on a, on a few thoughts. And the first is that Israel is contending with a deep-seated hatred, nurtured actually by leaders of the PLO, and nurtured over many years because I've seen these textbooks. This has occurred in the mosques, in the schools, in the newspapers, on the television. This has to stop. As one witness told our committee, incitement is the term we usually use, but that's not what we mean. What we, what we mean is teaching generations of young people to hate Jews by demonizing and dehumanizing them. That is the point. That is what we seek to address here. That's what the Taylor Force Act seeks to do. Because the other aspect of this is that people are being lured to terrorism by more than just words. They're being lured there by this concept of pay to slay, by this inducement, by this financial reward that says the longer the sentence, the more people that are murdered, the greater the stipend that goes to you when you get out, goes to your family in the meantime, or goes to your family if you've martyred yourself in doing, undertaking this act of murder. So, our, uh, so we want to make sure that we do this right and that we send a clear message to the Palestinian Authority that payments for acts of terrorism are unacceptable. Now on Iran, the U.S. has got to respond to the full range of threats from Iran, not just their nuclear program, because we see in Syria and in Iraq, and we see it right up along western Syria now, with the Quds forces and the IRGC. They're taking advantage of this fight against ISIS. And they're moving in, they're brutalizing Syrians, but they've seized so much territory. And meanwhile, Hezbollah, which is Iran's terror proxy, is amassing fighters and troops along Israel's border in the north, along the border in the east, and Iran continues to acquire destabilizing conventional weapons, but also intercontinental ballistic missiles. The, the administration has taken a realistic approach on Iran, recognizing the full range of these threats. This is what we have been messaging in a bipartisan way on our committee. This is what Brad Sherman and I and Mike McCall and the other members, Elliot Engel, have been talking about as we push these policies. Congress and the administration must work together to confront these threats while ensuring Iran never develops a nuclear capability. And I will add another point here because that approach was evident just over a week ago when the administration implemented a provision that Congress passed in July, as Mike McCall shared with you, designating Iran's powerful Revolutionary Guards under the terrorism sanctions that he had advocated. This has got to represent the beginning of a cooperative effort to turn up the pressure on Iran, and this week the House is going to do its part by bringing up my legislation on the House floor that we passed out of committee uh, targeting Iran's ballistic missile program and targeting Hezbollah, the regime's lead, leading terrorist proxy. On Qatar, it has a disturbing history of facilitating radicalization and of broken promises to reform its behavior. In 2014, for instance, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, 
withdrew from their ambassadors from Qatar because they said Qatar was interfering with their internal affairs, promoting extremism through Al Jazeera and other Qatari media networks and supporting the Muslim Brotherhood throughout the region. After that dispute, Qatar reportedly promised to address these issues, promised not to harbor persons with harmful agendas toward the other Gulf states, and promised not to support any organization fighting the legitimate governments in Yemen and in Egypt. Qatar has failed to live up to its words, which is why Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, and Bahrain cut ties with Qatar this past June. Shamefully, until May of this year, Qatar was also hosting senior Hamas financiers. After Representative Mast, myself, and several other members, including Mr. Sherman, Mr. Brad Sherman, introduced legislation increasing sanctions against those that provide support to Hamas, Qatar expelled those senior Hamas financiers. But given Qatar's history of false reform and broken promises, I am concerned that this is a tactical move, not a strategic shift away from supporting Hamas. Doha must take serious measures to fundamentally alter its policies. No more bait and switch and no more backsliding. We need real commitments from Qatar to end its permissive attitude and actions toward violent extremists. And on uh, our Hamas bill, a continuing impediment to peace and security for the Middle East is Hamas. This de deadly terrorist organization continues to work towards Israel's destruction. Hamas uses other human beings as shields by hiding their terror tunnels under schools. I've seen them myself, so has Chairman McCall and other members of our committee here, and our, we saw them as recently as our last trip to Israel in August. Hamas is responsible for the murder of more than 400 Israelis and of 25 Americans. Representative mass legislation further isolates Hamas. It's very simple. Anyone who funds or provides support to Hamas should face U.S. sanctions. Hamas is a foreign terrorist group and specially designed specifically by the United States as a global terrorist threat. So, uh, and I'll mention one last issue I wanted to bring up, and that was the Muslim Brotherhood. We need to push back against extremist ideologies like this one. It is a movement staunchly hostile to secularism. It is steeped in anti-Semitism. In many cases, they exploit democratic institutions to further their sectarian aims, having no intention to share power. They are by no means a benign movement and must be effectively countered by employing moderate voices, including through more effective broadcasting. We must go after its leaders, those that meet the criteria for individual terrorism sanctions. So um, I would just now like to thank all of you. Thank you for giving uh, the opportunity to me and my colleagues, and um, especially Mr. Force, to be with you to address you today. And good work uh, on your development on implementing policy. Thank you so much.